welcome to the session on the adaptive and iterative integration for microservices and cloud native architecture. So, so the target for my session is like uh, to integrate or connect uh, some topics which you have heard during these uh, two days. So I mainly focusing on five different topics and how they can be integrated. So the first thing we would be adaptive, iterative, integration, cloud native architecture and microservices. So you have been hearing these topics at various depth during this uh, course of the two days. So my challenge would be to how you can integrate these systems and build a real integration platform which is modern and architecturally sound. So let's see how we can achieve this. So the overview of my session is, uh, I will be first talking about integration and digital transformation. So these topics might not be new for you, but I will talk about uh, how we can use integration in a digital transforming enterprise. And also then I will be talking about the role of integration in cloud native architectures. So you may be listening into this cloud native word again and again, but I will be talking about what you can do with integration in a cloud native architecture. Then I will be talking about a few microservices integration patterns which you can use in a microservices architecture. So finally, I will be giving you a glimpse of uh, how you can realize this cloud native and microservices architecture with WSO2 integration platform. So these are the my high level topics which I am going to cover during this session. So first, uh, digital transformation and integration are tightly coupled. For example, uh, when we say digital transformation, which means uh, you need to, uh, in today's world, you need to build uh, digital systems. Basically, you need to convert your business into a digi digital business. So when you are doing that, one of the key parts or one of the key requirements of the digital transformation is integration. So, so in your enterprise, whether you are a manufacturing company, healthcare company, insurance, bank, financial, so any in your enterprise, you may have so many different systems which uh, basically uh, gives you a certain set of functionalities. So the, the integration aspect of this uh, integration aspect of this digital transformation is to connect these systems and basically provide a valuable output to your consumers. So one of the things uh, when you are doing these digital transformations is it is not a one-off thing. So which means uh, at the beginning of your project, you may be having five systems. They may be talking in different protocols, they may be using different messaging formats, but when you are designing this uh, integration project, you need to think about the future as well. So it is not a one-off thing that you just integrate these five systems and build the enterprise architecture. So it is not like that. So based on our experience, we have seen that when you are building these systems, you need to think about the future as well. So you need to think about how extensible your platform is. So what are the extension points you are going to give when there are new systems coming into the picture? And, and also you need to think about what are the new architectural trends in the market and how you can uh, support these uh, new trends or new technologies within your in integration platform. And also one of the important things of the digital transformation is it is iterative and you need to be adaptive. So iterative means, uh, you, let's say you uh, build an integration system connecting two different systems and when you uh, when you basically go down the line two, three years to the future, you will get same set of requirements. So in that kind of scenario, what you need to do is you need to build some uh, mechanisms or processes so that you can do this thing iteratively. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So in that kind of scenarios, you need to make sure you have uh, proper processes and automation capabilities so that you can iterate this process processes easily. And also the adaptive nature means uh, you need to adapt to various conditions. Uh, for example, let's say uh, your business is acquired by a large organization. So how you can adapt to that situation? So in that situation, you may be having thousands of different systems bring into uh, integrate with your existing enterprise architecture. 
So you need to make sure that uh, you are following this uh, iterative, iterative and adaptive approach when you are building an integration system. And uh, so let's understand uh, these concepts at a very high level. So what is cloud native? So you will hear this term uh, uh, many times during these sessions. So basically the cloud native means methodology of building and running applications that fully exploits the power of cloud computing. So if we think about uh, cloud computing, the advantages of cloud computing is it is highly available and you can scale. And it is uh, basically uh, you can easily uh, convert your idea into an application using the cloud computing infrastructures. So when you are building an application, you need to think about these capabilities and you need to leverage these capabilities uh, in a cloud native architecture. So that is uh, one of the important things when we discuss about the cloud native architectures. So let's uh, talk about cloud native applications. So one of the things you need to realize is, uh, so when you are building applications and deploy in the cloud, you need to think about the underlying capabilities and the advantage of the cloud. So let's say you deploy an heavyweight ESB in cloud. So that doesn't mean that you are adapting the cloud properly. So you need to make sure your applications are designed for this cloud native architecture. So in modern days, uh, you have the microservices architecture and the serverless functions. So these are basically designed in a way they will utilize the cloud native infrastructure and the capabilities. And also when you are building these applications, you always need to package these applications in containers so that you can easily scale them up, scale them down. And also, uh, you need to run these uh, applications on a continuous delivery model. Basically, you have to build CI, CD pipelines along with your applications. Uh, finally, uh, there is a concept called adaptive governance. So adaptive governance means uh, when you have uh, new requirements, you need to be able to basically support these uh, new requirements in an adaptive manner. So if you have built your architecture so that uh, you are running uh, uh, monolithic applications in the cloud, you can't achieve this uh, capability. So that is uh, one of the important things when you are designing these cloud native applications. So the, this figure you might have seen, so this is uh, also included in Tyler's keynote as well. So this is uh, the rise of cloud native applications. So uh, if you think about uh, five decades back, so we have these uh, monolithic applications, mainframes and then uh, with the cu consumer demands and the application uh, requirements, we have basically disaggregated these large applications into smaller chunks. So uh, with these uh, companies like Amazon, Uber, Airbnb, so they have uh, requirements to serve billions of transactions per day. So how they have achieved these uh, requirements? By disaggregating the architecture into uh, architectures like microservices and serverless so that they can scale based on the requirements. So this is uh, one of the trends in the market today. Uh, if you uh, read this book, uh, The Art of Scalability, in this book, uh, it, it basically discusses about uh, three dimensions to scaling. So if you need to scale an application, there are three dimensions you can do it. So if you think about the x-axis, uh, it is the horizontal duplication, which means uh, you are cloning one instance of the application multiple times. So that is the horizontal scaling. You can have more and more nodes spin up. You can have more instances of the same application. Then the y-axis scaling is functional decomposition, which means uh, if you think about the microservices architecture, we are de decomposing a large application into small pieces. So that is the functional decomposition. And the z-axis is data partitioning. So when you are basically dividing this large monolith into small applications, you need to think about data partitioning as well. So one microservice will be dealing with a set of data. Uh, the other application will be dealing with another set of data. Likewise, so you can scale an application to Google's uh, or Amazon's scale by following these three dimensions. 
So today we are talking about these uh, microservices, cloud native, serverless. So all these architectures are following these three dimensions to scaling. So uh, why microservices architecture? So you may have uh, listened about this uh, so many times. So in basic terms, uh, microservices are developed to do its work at best. So it, it is dedicated a particular functionality and it is uh, it needs to do that work at very best level. And also you need to be able to run, modify and scale independently. So you need to be able to build these CI-CD pipelines with the microservices. And also the main requirement is innovate fast. So you need to be able to innovate fast so that you don't lose to your competitors. So these are uh, very high level uh, requirements of microservices architecture and then uh, it comes the real problem. So it is uh, integrating microservices and cloud native applications. So now we understood that the requirement for these uh, microservices, serverless kind of uh, architectures is when you are scaling your organization, you need to have uh, more and more services. They, they can be microservices or they can be serverless functions. But the thing is like uh, you cannot deliver the consumer requirements through these uh, single pieces of functionalities. You need to integrate them. So that is the hard problem uh, I'm going to discuss about in upcoming slides. So uh, when we are uh, trying to solve this problem, so the first way or the, the way we have been using for a long time is uh, using a centralized uh, integration bus. So basically you have your services, uh, service A, B, C, D, so these can be microservices, serverless functions, or uh, monolithic applications. So in the past, uh, we have used ESB to integrate these different types of applications, which were uh, using different application protocols, messaging formats, different transformations. So all these functionality was uh, built in this uh, centralized layer, which we called as ESB. So this, this was the uh, past and even modern, enterprise systems also uh, using this uh, ESB type of approach. But the next approach is uh, smart endpoints and dump pipes, which means you are dividing the functionality of the ESB into multiple applications like microservices. So in this case, you can see microservices XYZ is developed for these integration requirements so that you can scale them independently. Let's say uh, a consumer demand is high for microservice X then you can scale that independent of the other services. And also if there is a downtime or if there is an issue with a particular microservice, then the, the other services are not affected. So likewise, uh, and also the, the polyglot programming model where you can write your microservices in different programming languages and frameworks. So this is the next level of uh, solving this microservices integration problem. So in this architecture also, uh, you can see that uh, there are, there, this is kind of a layered architecture. So, so this is uh, one of the practical use cases uh, of Netflix. So, uh, so at the beginning of uh, the Netflix uh, microservices story, they had thousands of microservices and they have a single orchestration layer, which is the API management layer. So the problem with uh, this architecture is they had to uh, build so many uh, integration logic into this uh, orchestration layer. So when there are new devices coming into the market, uh, which consumes these Netflix APIs, they have to build a different kind of logic in the orchestration layer. So after a certain period of time, they have identified that this is not the correct way to uh, do this microservice integration. So let's see how we can achieve that. So let's see how to integrate these microservices. So there are uh, different patterns and I will be talking about these uh, different patterns uh, in the upcoming slides. So the first pattern is active composition or the orchestration pattern. So, uh, so here you can see uh, there are different colored microservices and API services. So the, the yellow colored microservices are the core services or the atomic services which, which will do a certain set of business functionalities at their best. Then we have the integration or the composite microservices where they will connect multiple 
backend or the core microservices and provide a certain set of business functionality. So on top of that, uh, you, we need to secure those APIs, uh, secure those functionalities, uh, monitor them, and govern them. To do that, uh, we need to uh, basically design these API microservices. So that was the uh, topic uh, of uh, the previous two sessions uh, done by Nuan and Sanjeev. So basically, uh, you can see in this architecture, the microservices are everywhere. So the entire architecture consists of a microservices type uh, applications. So the advantage of this type of architecture is you can scale each and every application independent of the other. So if there is an issue with the, let's say, microservice uh, C, uh, it will not impact the other parts of the system. So one of the things uh, with this kind of uh, architecture is uh, when you are designing these uh, systems, uh, you cannot design your system at the very first time with this type of approach. So you need to come to this level uh, step by step. So I will be talking about how you can achieve that as well. So the idea here is if you have a requirement like a request res response kind of a communication and you need to implement this microservices architecture, uh, this is a good pattern you can follow. So uh, this is uh, one of the patterns uh, which is uh, highly uh, regarded as a good pattern for integrating different microservices. And then we, we also have this uh, pattern of reactive composition or choreography pattern. So in this pattern, you can see uh, we have a central event bus and we have multiple microservices communicating to the applications through this event bus. So in this architecture, uh, so we basically consider the asynchronous part of the communication aspect. So uh, when a particular action or when a particular set of data appears on a microservice, it will push that data to the event bus. Then through the event bus, applications can receive that information. So this architecture is good if you are implementing an asynchronous kind of communication or asynchronous event-driven architecture. So then, uh, so how we can uh, identify what is best for your enterprise, whether it's active architecture or the reactive architecture. So I think the active composition is uh, really good if you are doing an interactive services. For example, if you are a banking application, a web application, uh, a website like Amazon or Google or eBay, because they, they expect the response when they send the request. So if you are doing those kind of compositions, uh, you can follow the active composition architecture. And the reactive composition architecture is good if you are doing an asynchronous type of integration. So in that case, the composition logic is OPEC and it is uh, implemented at the uh, applications and the microservices level. Uh, so, so finally, uh, so when you are building a real application, you always need both synchronous and asynchronous functionality. So it is not about uh, one particular communication mechanism. So finally, we can come up to a, this type of architecture where we have both active and reactive composition uh, using uh, this architecture. So here you can see uh, we have the microservices, core microservices, composite microservices, and the event bus for any asynchronous communication uh, we can use an event bus. And then we have the API microservices at the top layer. Through that, we will expose the functionalities to the consumers. So, so one of the things uh, we have identified when we are uh, dealing with customers, when we are doing integration projects, is there is no greenfield enterprise. So unless you are a startup, in every enterprise, there are systems which have been using for 10 to 20 uh, years. So you need to think about those systems when you are building these uh, microservices architectures or when you are bringing the microservices or cloud native architectures into your enterprise. So let's see how we can uh, practically implement a cloud native architecture in a brownfield enterprise. So there are certain patterns we have identified which we can use to uh, bring the microservices story into your existing brownfield enterprise. 
So the first pattern is anti-corruption layer pattern. So in this pattern, uh, there are two subsystems. So subsystem A and subsystem B. So the subsystem A is the modern architecture where you have the microservices, you have different data stores for microservices. But while you are building this microservice architecture, you need to bring in the existing subsystems. So how you can do is by building an anti-corruption layer. So this is like an adapter. For example, when you are doing a presentation, uh, if your particular port is not matching with that uh, output port, you need to use an adapter. You need to use a, a particular adapter. So this anti-corruption layer is doing that uh, adaptation part. For example, if this subsystem B is implemented on, on JMS transport, but these uh, microservices are using HTTP transport, you need to transform these uh, protocols. So these kind of capabilities, these kind of uh, functionalities are done through the anti-corruption layer. So in a, in a more practical sense, uh, you can consider that as an ESB or another uh, message broker. So, so this is uh, one of the patterns you can follow uh, when you are bringing microservice or cloud native architectures into your enterprise. And then we have this uh, strangler pattern. So the idea of the strangler pattern is, uh, here you can see there is the legacy portion. So at the beginning, at the early migration, you have a huge set of uh, legacy applications and you have a very small uh, portion of the modern microservices architecture application. So how you can uh, basically uh, moving away from the legacy architecture to the microservice architecture is using a strangler facade. So this uh, strangler facade is like, uh, so let's say you have uh, thousands of uh, different uh, applications or services in your enterprise. So what you do is you move 10 services to this new architecture and using this uh, facade layer, so it can be an API manager or it can be a ESB. So through this layer, you expose the functionality to the users so that they don't understand or they don't see what is the underlying technology whether it's the legacy application or the microservices architecture. So uh, with the time goes on, uh, you can basically move more and more functionality of the legacy uh, architecture into the microservices architecture. So finally, once the migration is completed, you can see your modern architecture is uh, fully migrated. So likewise, uh, you can follow this pattern in most of the cases. So then, uh, Let's see how we can achieve this kind of uh, approach or this kind of uh, architecture using the existing WSO2 technology. So here uh, you can see uh, that uh, previous uh, hybrid approach we have discussed. So we have the microservices, uh, core microservices, integration microservices, and the API microservices. So how we can achieve uh, this uh, microservices migration using WSO2 technologies, we have certain products which can provide these uh, different functionalities. For example, that anti-corruption layer or the API facade layer. So we have products we have built to support these functionality. So in this case, you can see, uh, if you want to uh, deploy these uh, core microservices, uh, we have this uh, uh, micro, micro ESB, which is the latest addition to our integration platform you can deploy one uh, integration service or a microservice uh, using the micro integrator. Or else you can use uh, Ballerina. So Ballerina is the cloud native programming language uh, which we have built. So using uh, Ballerina or micro integrator, uh, you can build this microservices layer. Then when you are connecting with the legacy applications, you need some kind of translation of protocols and messaging formats. So these kind of capabilities you can achieve through the enterprise integrator. And finally, when you want to implement the API management functionality, you can go with the uh, micro API gateway or the standard API manager. And if you have any identity or security related requirements like single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, uh, you can go with the WSO2 identity server. So with the WSO2 components, uh, you can achieve this type of architecture uh, with uh, existing functionalities. 
So uh, finally, I will be talking about the service mesh because it is kind of a hot topic when we talk about microservices. You always hear about the service mesh. So the service mesh is about inter-microservice communication. So when you have multiple microservices, you need to make sure that those microservices can talk to each other and they can use other functionalities. So the idea of the service mesh is, uh, service mesh is divided into two components. That is the data plane and the control plane. So the data plane is responsible for communication between uh, two microservices. So here you can see, uh, in this microservice A, there is the business logic part and there are primitive network functions. For example, if that microservice needs to call the microservice B, it needs to understand the network. So that functionality part, uh, you can offload to the, this service mesh sidecar. So this uh, service mesh sidecar is responsible for communicating with another microservice. When you are communicating to that microservice, there can be failures. You need to retry, you need to load balance, you need to discover the service. So these kind of functionalities you can achieve through the service mesh sidecar along with the control plane. So the idea of the control plane is uh, you can uh, basically have functionalities like service discovery or uh, basically defining the service mesh. So that is the functionality of a service mesh in a microservice kind of an architecture. So if you think about WSO2 products, a WSO2 API micro gateway can function as the service mesh sidecar because it can understand the network level uh, information and it can connect with other microservices. So when you are uh, basically uh, uh, designing a service mesh or when you are going to use a service mesh, uh, you need to make sure that uh, inter-service communication resiliency, as I mentioned, like the, the timeouts, retries, circuit breaker kind of functionalities are available with the selected service mesh. So there are service mesh implementations like Istio, Linkerd, uh, likewise. When you are selecting a service mesh for your architecture, you need to make sure this functionality is available with that service mesh. And also, uh, when you are basically doing this communication or when you are uh, doing the configuring the service mesh, you need to make sure that you never implement the business logic at the service mesh because it is not going to scale. So the service meshes are uh, designed to be lightweight. So you, you should not implement your business logic at the service mesh layer. And also the data plane is more or less about the synchronous communication. So it cannot handle the asynchronous communication at the moment, but in the future uh, it will be supported. So finally, so this is my final slide. So, so we are basically proposing this cell-based architecture uh, which is kind of a, a future, uh, more of a future thinking when you are implementing a, a fully, uh, fully microservices or serverless kind of uh, architecture, uh, you can divide your certain functionalities into uh, certain cells. I think Asanka has talked about this uh, and I just put this as a reference. If you want to know more about the cell-based architecture, we have a, a reference uh, architecture and the reference uh, guide. So you can refer to that, but this will be the future when you implement a fully fledged microservices architecture. So at conclusion, so cloud native shift is inevitable. So which means you cannot avoid that. So you need to prepare for that. If you are building any enterprise system, you need to prepare for the cloud native shift. And also the adaptive and iterative approach is required. As I mentioned, like when you build a system, uh, for a certain set of uh, integration functionalities, you need to make sure that this, this effort you put to be, can be adaptive and iterative so that you can easily bring in another system when there are more and more requirements. And also, uh, you can use a hybrid set of microservices integration patterns. As I mentioned, like you can follow uh, the strangler pattern or anti-corruption layer pattern at the beginning of your migration. So that's it.